Well, good afternoon, everyone, and what a nice place to be. Beautiful weather, beautiful church, Sioux Falls here. You know, I'm, I'm privileged and I'm really humbled to be here because, you know, little old Aberdeen up there, you know, we think about Sioux Falls a lot, so especially to the business people here, it's like, I don't know if I can tell you anything you don't already know. But um, anyway, so there's one reason I'm here. It's because I love Jesus. That's just, just as simple as that. And you know, I had, took me quite a while to say that. I guess I always did. But uh, I just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, are starting to recognize more and more as I get older the gifts and the miracles and all the stuff that he's done, God and, and you know, the, has done for me in my life. Well, I started out, you know, probably got the grace pretty young, I guess, you know, when you reflect on everything. I grew up uh, up on a farm 50 miles northwest of Aberdeen in a little town. Well, we were on the farm, dairy farm, had five brothers and a sister, and I ended up being third. And I kind of learned my negotiating skills fairly early because my two brothers, my next older brother's six years older, and then, and then the oldest brother's only 15 months older than him. So those two were little guys running around and I happened to be a rainbow baby, I guess. I don't know if any of you, I, I never heard of it till a while back. It's my mother, I guess, had a miscarriage in between. And then I came along, but those two, especially my next older brother, he had all the attention until I came along. So consequently, you know, he wasn't really happy with me to be around, but we're good friends, all of our brothers. We don't fight, uh, we argue a little bit, you know, about this and that, but not anything really too bad. So it was a good family dynamic, worked hard, had good parents. Just didn't have a lot, but we, you know, 20 bucks or something, we could ever get a hold of that. We thought we were rich. So I went to country school for seven years, and probably what really started out my success was that I was the checker champion of Huffman Hilltop School, this country school. And when they talk about uphill both ways, they weren't kidding up there, but there's two hills to go up. So that's a fact. And we walked to school, rode a horse to school, got a ride to school. But anyway, this checker champion, I was a seventh grader. And so we, there was kindergarten through eighth there. And uh, so they had the playoffs, of course, and we were playing checkers and I took a couple days and finally got down to the championship. And it was kind of tough, but I beat the guy. And a couple years later, I'm thinking, you know, I don't know how big a deal that really was because I was a seventh grader and I beat the third grader. So, but anyway, I was happy for a little while. Well, when I was seven years old, Bishop Hoke, we um, were confirmed at, must have been first grade, I guess, or second. And you know, I had the, it definitely had an experience of the Holy Spirit. Really didn't know what it was at the time, but I think sometimes, I'm gonna say this wrong, but the two people walking on the road to Emmaus and they, run into the stranger and he's kind of following along with them and they're complaining because of, yeah you don't know what happened you never heard the news did you and eventually when they when he broke bread with them they finally understood oh boy weren't our hearts burning with love and of course that's what I felt when I was seven years old so it was early in my life and uh, I picked uh, Michael the Archangel as my patron saint I think it is and so I think maybe over the course of time and all the temptations that probably we all run into that I was able to resist a lot of it or just steer to different directions. So I thank God for that all the time. We had summer Bible school up there. It was really an important part for me. And we had a lot of sisters and seminarians. There was two or three seminarians or at least came during that June, middle of June after school was out. And I really liked those guys and the, ga and the well, the nuns sometimes, you know, they were seemed like they're a little tough on a guy maybe, but it was <laughs> what it was. And uh, so I really felt comfortable around them and really kind of thought about being a priest there and um, for a few years. But then, and I always used to read in, in uh, uh, church. And of course I studied that scripture pretty hard, you know, especially Sundays you got two uh, readings and I read it and I read it and I read it tried to make sure I could pronounce the words right one thing but also what's the meaning of this and uh, you know I think when I look back on that too that really helped in some of the formation I remember on the Easter vigil Father Imberry some of you may know he passed away good guy he was up there he was our priest there for a little while and I read all the readings for him there was about 10 of them you know and we got done I was maybe 14 I want to say at that time he gave me a card with a five dollar bill in it man I thought I was rich I think you could have filled two cars with gas for that $5 bill at that time, <laughs> not anymore. So I thought I hit the jackpot. Anyway, um, 
But I did like milking the cows, so we milk cows all the time, and I could have, but I was an asthmatic, because one of my health problems was I had big time asthma problems. And my dad hauled me to the hospital more than once in the middle of the night, because I couldn't breathe. So I guess there was a hand, and the good Lord's hand was in there too. I just didn't uh, know it, you know, but I didn't really worry about it. And uh, we'd, so as I got a little older, I, I left home, went to work right out of high school, but I always went to church. The first semester after high school, I went to California instead of going to college. And, um, and I had friends along the way, you know, that had moved there, for, like Rock Springs, Wyoming. And at that time, there was a big deal where they were doing a lot of iron working for the coal area. And I'd go to church, you know, we might party at night, but I'd still get up and go to church. I, I don't know if I could say I went 100% of the time, but it was pretty close. And uh, so I came back to Aberdeen. My dad said, ah, come on back. I had a job out there. I came back with a little more money than I went with. And uh, it was kind of a spreading my wings a little bit. Well, I got back. I knew I wanted to be in business. I really had a feeling or a strong desire for business. Well, at that time, in the very early 70s, the business administration degree was, was worth much because you'd end up working for the contractor. I ain't saying anything wrong with it, but I thought, man, four years, then still going to be hard to get a job. I didn't have to know how to drive a dump truck. I knew that already. But you know, I would have probably done it too. So I, but I had a cousin that was a nursing home administrator. But for some reason, I don't know just how this all played out. I go down to Northern, in Aberdeen, and I get in. Well, you want to go over here to register? Well, I'll go there. You know, it's kind of I don't know. Get in line. There's a line about oh I don't know maybe a hundred feet long. Two lines. Well, I waited and waited and waited and got up there. Finally, got up there. Talked to the gal. She said, "You're supposed to be over that line." Oh man. So I left and went to presentation. No, right there on the spot. I just got in the car and went to the other side of town, and registered up at PC, and they happened to have a long-term health care program, a two-year degree. So I did that, and then that year, well, one good thing about that college was 300 girls and five boys in the whole school. <laughs> well, I didn't marry one anyway, but not out of there. It was a pretty good ratio, though. Um, so uh, anyway, got started in college. Um, got a job at North Plains Press. It was a if some of you may have heard about the Dakota Farmer magazine, which was a magazine out of Aberdeen that covered North and South Dakota and the Fringe. And it was a pretty good magazine at the time, so it was an implant print shop, really, and I started there and really liked it. You know, I started right at the bottom, right at the very lowest point, and uh, kept working and finally told the guys, well, I think I can run them folders or cutters out there, because I was pretty mechanical. So I finally got, um, got to do that. And I prayed during this time for a wife. You know, I kind of want to get married. I was young, but you know how it is. I mean, I purposely prayed to send me a good wife. Well, I met her at work, and uh, she was also a Catholic. And eventually passed, or you know, got through with college and passed my state and national test and went out and got it. I told my boss at the time, after this was a couple years working there, I said, boy, Gordon, he was like a second dad to me and my boss at the printing company. I said, I got to quit. I, got, I spent two years in college. I got my tests passed and I got a job. Well, I said, can I just have a leave of work, from work here? Well, he said, I never did that before. So I left and of course I did not like it. You know, I love the people. And we had a guy there that was 92 in 1974, might be off a year. And he knew, he remembered the when Loyola burnt down in 1888. I mean, he, he couldn't remember what he had for lunch, but he knew that. <laughs> I mean, a good guy, really enjoyed it, but it was just way too slow pace. So I went back, kind of a, ate a little curl, you might say, and went back and went back to work and eventually became production manager there. And as production manager, it was just an eight hour day, but I liked that job a lot because he interacted with everybody in the plant, tried to get everything lined up, get it going, get production map, talk to the people, and this and that. And I didn't have quite enough to do it in those days for those of us that are older. If you're in any kind of an industry, for the, you'd get a stack of magazines about this high in a week. Well, we could, but they were only local, South Dakota, and mostly that Dakota Farmer magazine, but did some other commercial print. Well, I knew we could print nationally, but I was like 25, no, I was 24, and the boss was about 58, and he had already worked his 16 hours a day for a couple stints. He wasn't about, he didn't own it. He wasn't about to do that, so I, I don't know if I would say I was disgruntled, but I thought, you know, I'm starting my own company. So in 79, and then Matt, our oldest son, Matt, was born in 77, I started the company, and I told my wife, I said, you know, there's going to be two things that are going to happen here. I'm either going to make it or I ain't going to make it. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll support you. But I said, I'll go. In those days, four and a half bucks an hour was probably a decent money. I said, I'll get a job right away if I don't make it. So I started with nothing. And um, 
worked hard. You know, my wife is a rock, really been married like 47 years. And there was one night I came home, I had, had no jobs to start with, so I had to sell, which I didn't mind doing anyway. And I think I had two jobs and I screwed one of them up. Well, that's about 50%, right? I thought, oh, I'm done, I'm gonna quit, I ain't never gonna make it. So I never forget going home, up in the alley, stopped, went in, Matt's sitting in the high chair over here. I was sitting on this side, sat down, couldn't eat, losing weight, not much, but a little just running and nerves and everything. She said, just go back to work, you'll figure it out. Hmm, okay, so I did. You know, that little point there was a pretty important because if she just said, yeah, you know, throw the towel in, man, we're out of here, you can't do this. So she didn't, she was right behind me. So it was kind of a really a faith-based deal in a way too. I just knew I couldn't lose. One time, Gordon called me, the, the, my old boss again, because I stayed friends to him. I said, uh, well, he called me, well, he's worried, Roger. I go to lunch, I said, what's the matter? Well, he said, I heard the owner's now talking. Of course, he was in the know because he was a manager of that division. He said, I heard them talking, they're gonna put you out of business. I said, Gordon, they ain't got enough money to put me out of business. And I was, I might have said it a little different, to tell you the truth, but <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat that. But you know, when I, in all seriousness, when I think back on it, it was nothing but faith. I just was gonna outwork them, and I did. No money, zero. I think I took 400 bucks out in the first three months. So finally my wife said, you know what, Roger, we kinda need a few bills here to probably should pay, and she worked. So we did, I took some money give her a little bit there and uh, so a couple points you know as I got into business there I might be losing getting out of my sink here a little bit but you know one thing to keep in mind as managers owners whatever I've kind of come to believe that your employees if you have any kind of frustration level with your employees I don't care who they are they've got you know so here you are managing people think man I know this guy ain't doing his job right or gal whatever and you kind of carry on and they ain't getting better and this and that. They've got the same feeling on the other side. And, my, and I haven't ever done, always done this right, but my, my, my advice, of course in those days I didn't have an HR department, so I had to deal with it myself and sometimes I ignored it. Well, the moral of the story is this, that if you don't address that quick, you're just gonna lose the employee. You're gonna be upset, they're gonna be upset, ain't nobody gonna get ahead. So you gotta get after it right away. If there's, because I really believe there's a, in 90% of the cases, if not all, there's a mutual feeling. If we think that they're not doing the job, they don't feel like they're doing the job. You know, one time a guy came to me, he said, Roger, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So made an appointment, comes in. He says, uh, he was an okay employee, I would say average. He says, uh, I want to know about my job security. I said, don't come to me for job security. I said, that's you. I said, tell you what, I said, I'm, and I was, I don't think I was quite that cold about it, I hope. I said, uh, you know, I said, I'm gonna do everything I can to sell work, create an environment here as a team effort to get this job done. And I said, you know, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. It's for everybody, for the whole team. So I said, if you don't feel like, I said, the job security's gotta come from you, how good you feel you're doing the job. And maybe I could have helped him more, but that, because I had heard, the problem is earlier, is that I, a couple of years ago I had heard Gordon say that and then that company went broke. He, he told people, I was sitting as a young guy earlier now, back a few years when I worked for him, yeah, we got job security here. You know what? I don't want to scare anybody. I don't think you ain't going to get scared, but there's no job security. You do the best you can and hope to God that the business stays afloat or you might have to switch or something and you just got to have faith and go for it. If you're doing your job good, that's as good a job security as you're going to have. And I guess if you don't like who you work for, I'm not I'm a little antagonistic. No, I'm not. I, it's you just got to move on. So anyway, but it's, it, I love the people. I really, really did. Uh, and um, one of the things I did too when, when I needed to fire somebody, I say, oh boy. You know, I mean, none of that's ever fun. I mean, I suppose there was a few of them I was sort of happy to get rid of. But sometimes the people just couldn't do the job because they were just totally different personality. And... My, my trick was, and I, I advise this to you, I'd finally make my mind up. I'd make, get a point, hey, why don't you come and see me four o'clock on Friday, or something like that, the employee. Okay, so they'd come in the office, they'd say, hey, uh, excuse me a minute, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'd go in the bathroom, I'd get on my knees, and I'd say a couple Hail Marys, and I'd get back up and go in there, and I'd take a few deep breaths, and I'd start talking, you know, to kind of maintain a certain degree of respect for the people. And I don't know, I guess, I really don't know what that ratio is. It seems to me that I've got probably more people that, that have, have respect, even if I did fire them. I have some good friends that I fired because they just weren't in the right job. But we have to do it with a Christian attitude and feeling because 
you know, why, I mean, we fail sometimes about that. Um, so we've got to be kind. Okay, as the boys grew up, then they were getting a little older, and I finally, met I was working so many hours, I finally made a deal with Kathy. She needed time off, my wife did, because she worked a full-time job, took care of the boys. There were times when I got up at 5.30 in the morning, see the sun coming up, and go home. And then I had to have a little hobby farm on top of that, too, but I'd be going home at... I'd go home, I'd try to go home. We lived out in the country a ways. I'd go home about 5.30. Well, I ate a little bit quick and went back to town. Finally, I decided it doesn't pay to waste a half or an hour, really, to do that. So I just stayed in town, and uh, she needed some time off. I said, tell you what, Wednesday nights, come hell or high water, I'm coming home. I'll, I'll get them boys, and I'll, you just take the night off. Well, she had some good friends that she went out, and I, oh, we always trusted each other. So we did that for a lot of years, and then I took the boys, it was Wednesday night, so I took them to CCD. Because we, they went, we put them in Catholic school at, I think it was eighth, seventh grade, K through six, they went to public. And so they had to go to CCD. And uh, so I take them to CCD every night. Well, about a year goes by, I'm thinking to myself, because I had got to go wander around town, or I'd go back to work, or whatever, for an hour. I thought, you know, I might as well teach it. So I started teaching sixth grade CCD, and did that for 20 years. It was kind of a good thing, you know, and I was able to, connect. I had to make, well, when you talk about sacrifices, you know, what better sacrifice can you make? But boy, I had a rush from work sometimes to get there and get the job done. You know, at some point in time, then during our marriage, this is kind of an important deal, I think. My wife and I have quite a relationship. We're, oh, when, we start, when I started the business, I had hardly no work, but then a few jobs we had, I'd take it home, she'd put it together on the kitchen table. So maybe a month went by and I said, you know, Kathy, you got to come to work. Come to work with me, you know, at, at the shop. No, no, no. She kept saying no. Finally, after a month or two of talking about it, I said, Catherine, why don't you? No. She said, I'm not going to. She says, because one of us is going to have to be the boss and it ain't going to be you. <laughs> so well, that, was, that was the end of that deal. I'll tell you that. So anyway, somewhere along the line in this marriage, I was getting irritated with her. I suppose she was with me too, talk about whether you think somebody else you're mad at, they probably ain't got no better feelings for you. But anyway, I was kind of getting off track pretty, pretty hard in the marriage as far as re treating her right. So I, well, I called up Father Gadeet, say, hey, can I come and see you? Yeah, okay, so I go in there, sitting in his house and we're talking. He says to me, he said, Roger, he said three words. He said, just love her. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't believe it. You know, I went home, and that's what I, I mean, still once in a while, <laughs> gets a little dicey, you know what I mean? But no, I, I thought, boy, no, that is advice there. So simple, wasn't funny, just love her. These little things, these mountains, you're gonna make a doggone mountain out of a molehill, why? It's just, it makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but that really got me over a hump there, pretty good. So as I got older, I started to just see how much God's hand was in my success. And one of my faults is going way too fast without letting God kind of, hey, hey buddy, go over this way. Sometimes I go so fast, I don't even know which direction I'm going, but I usually get somewhere it makes a little bit of sense, but I, I struggle with that. A lot of times in confession, I'll say that. I say, boy, I just don't know. You know, I, I'm retired now, and I've got a bunch of stuff to do, and I'm blessed with grandkids. I just don't know if I'm doing the right thing all the time, but I guess if what works for me now is being retired, and I don't do it every single day, but... If, if I get up, I'm not sure just what to do. I mean, I got plenty to do, but I'm kind of wondering what to do, let's put it that way. I'll either go sit and say the rosary or maybe go to mass sometimes. And uh, so that helps too. Um, okay. So the boys, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here. Now the boys, both of them, I got, you know, here again, talk about being blessed. They, the oldest one went to University of Wisconsin out in print management. I, I never discouraged them from being in business, but I really never, I don't think I just, oh, you gotta do it and twist their arm. I thought, well, whatever they wanna do. You know, I believe that you got to be happy in what you do. If you're not fit for the job, man, I don't know, I wouldn't do it. I just, and that's early in my career with this nursing home job that happened. I thought, you know, I just never, ever questioned myself after that. But anyway, so with your boys in business, and you'll maybe understand this a little bit here. So here's how my experience is with boys. So I had two boys. When they're eighth or ninth grade, in other words, what I'm saying is I've been dumb and smart at least four times now with my kids. 
at least. The first time is when they were eight or, eight or ninth, eighth or ninth grade. Of course, in boys, you know, you never know. A lot of stuff happened in there. And they think you're the dumbest guy in the whole state, pretty much, because you don't know this and you don't know that. You don't know what you're doing because they're trying to get their spring, you know, trying to make your own decisions. And, but I also had a rule in my house. I said, there's no privacy. I mean, yeah, bathroom, yeah, that stuff. But anyway, otherwise, there's no privacy. In other words, what's in your room, I can go look in your room. A lot of parents do the wrong thing there. I said, no, until you're 18, I'm in charge of this household. Well, I didn't think so anyway, but you know, it's what I did. When they went to college, then you kind of, now you got a little smarter again because they wanted you to give them some money, of course. <laughs> and then when they started work for me, I'm dumb again. So, because now they know better how to do it. And we, you know, I knew this was all gonna happen, so I'm saying it in good humor, and I just kind of let this stuff pass. And so now the stage I'm in now, I'm retired. Oh, I'm pretty smart again. So, I don't know if there's another, another one coming up here, I'm not sure, we'll see. So we really have a good relationship. You know, they'll call, hey, how's it going? What's, you know, if they wanna do something pretty major. Well, I've got nine grandchildren, lucky again, blessed. But one of the things, talk about a miracle here, my, Oldest grandchild, actually, I was actually down in Sioux City at a printing. I was the president of that for a while when I was down in, no, I was in, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was in Sioux City, driving home, Justin calls me, but that's our youngest boy, had the first grandchild. She was, what is it, I can't read it, what does it say, Joel? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, so I'm halfway there, huh? Okay, um, anyway, uh, calls me, said, oh, yeah, he said, uh, Jane's on an airplane, heading, she was 14 months old, heading to Fargo. Uh, what's up? Well, got, didn't know for sure, but I remember a, maybe a week or so before that, my wife and I were babysitting her. No, she's a little, you know, this high. And she could walk at 14 months, but Kathy, we were babysitting, and Kathy gave her a bath, she handed her to me, and then she dried her off, and I put her down, she just fell down, she wouldn't walk no more. I don't know about that. And she wasn't feeling good. They had had her to the doctor a few times. It just so happened there was a pediatric cancer doctor from California that had come through Aberdeen and was doing a little work there for a while. And he took her in there this one afternoon, finally he said, get her to Fargo. Her spleen was seven inches long, with full of like white, whatever happens when you have leukemia. And so she got up there and man, they put her into ICU for seven or eight days and just so happened it was over Easter. I think it was Good Friday, of course, middle of day and we go to church. Somewhere along the line, I might be getting this wrong, but wherever it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then I went, then I broke down and wept about that. And son of a gun, if she didn't come out of it, she's 16 now, really good kid. You know, we just, of course, always have that in the back of your mind, but they say that if you make it five years, your chances are just about as good as anybody else that you won't get it again. But that was a I, about a year later, I'm thinking to myself, that was a miracle error, that she made it. So, got to thank God every day for that. I pray for having one of those grandkids with five girls, four boys, one of them to be a priest or a, or a sister or some religious life. You know, I thank God for my handicaps too. I got quite a few handicaps. I, uh, well, quite a few, probably hundred, I don't know. But anyway, the, uh, this asthma, of course, I've got it under control. You know, back when I was younger, they really didn't have too much medicine for it, so I just suffered. And, uh, but it's really molded me, I think, I, I guess, I don't know, life's pretty precious to me, but I also am colorblind. Now I'm a printer and I'm colorblind. That's interesting, right? It'd be like a blind carpenter, sort of. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I, uh, <laughs> the only thing I could do, I didn't even really, I knew I was colorblind, but I didn't know how bad I was colorblind and uh, until I went, tried to get into the Air Force and uh, I, they weren't going to take me because I could, well, I don't know if you ever took that book, you know, you a couple pages in there on them supposed to see a number in there? Well, I made it to page two, I think. So uh, that was the end of that deal. Well, anyway, so how do you get by on that? Well, I, I did my own printing too for a while, but it was mostly black and white or color back 45 years ago or so. So I just look at the, I could see some colors, but I'd get a color chart and I'd kind of look at it sideways and watch the sheen of the rollers and come and run heavy on ink usually, dark, a little more on the darker side. But no, most people didn't say too much because they thought they were paying for ink on paper. So I'd rather have it dark than light. So I got, and I, and I had to ask people all the time, you know, eventually started hiring people. And um, back in, so in 86, Quality Quick Print was doing pretty good. And this other company, this North Plains Press, got into financial trouble. So they, a group, a couple guys came to me and said, hey, Roger, you want part of that? I said, yeah, I know exactly what to do with the company. 
Well, then you could be president. Well, whatever. I have been ever since, I guess. Or maybe now I'm chairman of the board or whatever. But anyway, so we buy the company, and oh, there goes another 16 hours a day for two years. Made a mistake there, too, big time. I had myself and another guy were the managers, and I talked the crew into most of them to coming back. Because you know how that is when you have a company that's in trouble, and everybody leaves, and it was sad about a month. And then I tried to get everybody, of course, some of them had already moved on, but we got it going again. And I didn't think I could afford another, actually, I hardly never took no salary, I just took it out of quality. And anyway, uh, I had another guy hired, and there was one deal that happened there, it cost me like 40,000 bucks one year, where the job, where our job went bad. Well, didn't, didn't really make any money, but I know if I'd have had somebody hired. So I was working my tail off, because I was gonna save money, and nobody got ahead. So, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten that trap, where you start just working so hard, you're going backwards. It happened to me a couple times. I finally hired a manager, it took me a while, got a manager hired, and slowly got it off the ground. We, uh, we built a new building in 94. We've got 180,000 square foot building up there. We had 415 employees. We're down some from that now because it's harder to, and that's quite a few years ago too, you know, where we um, automate more so that we can do more with less people because you really can't hire them anyway. I mean, it's pretty hard, you know, how that goes. So I thank God for my handicaps, and back to that colorblind deal for a little bit, is that I had to ask, I had to, sometimes a customer would come in here, you want to print, print this for me? Okay. Hey, just a second, I'll be right back. And, hey, what color is this here? <laughs> go back, okay, yeah, I can do it. I, you know, no kidding, that's what I had to do. So I had to ask people and work with people because I didn't know what I was doing for some of the time. Um, let's see here. I've been truly blessed, there's no question about that. Um, my wife and I was telling you we had some interesting, <laughs> one time we were on vacation, this was only a couple years ago. I've got a hobby farm so I kind of don't really have any animals now because we're gone in the winter time. But, so we're down in, down in, uh, where is, uh, uh, that, like Cabela's, but that other one, down in Springfield, Missouri, there we go. And of course that ain't very far from Arkansas. So I'm on the computer one night in a hotel, look, hey they got donkeys for sale. I'm gonna call him guy. He had ten donkeys, nice big ones, about ears about that long, and nice black donkeys. I, I'm buying ten donkeys. He had them for sale. So I was talking to my wife back and forth. Finally, she says, "Listen, I already got a jackass. We don't need any more." <laughs> First, then I responded with, "You are a pain, and I won't stay anything else." <laughs> well, we have a pretty good time though, but I never did buy them. But anyway, so anyway. Um, I'm going to probably leave you with this, some thoughts. I can talk all day about the businesses, and uh, we're all in the same boat. We all have a mission. It's hard to keep a real, it's, it's not hard, but how do you, you know, they were, we're hit from every side in a way with this society the way it is about Christianity. I just heard the other day the beef plant up in Aberdeen that they, had 30 Somalians, Islam, like whatever, Muslim, they walked out up there just a couple days ago because they wouldn't let them pray whatever it is, seven or nine times a day. Now, I don't know what you do in that case because how can you do that? If you run a factory and you, you know, and then we're not supposed to have the, the Ten Commandments up or say anything about God or Christ or anything in our, in our uh, businesses, but I mean, I don't know what the answer is here because it wasn't very long and then the same I was this, somebody told me this yesterday morning and by the afternoon I was talking to somebody else said, yeah, there were some Puerto Ricans just in here and they're Catholic and said, well, if they want seven times to pray, then I want seven times to pray. Now, what would you do there as a, as a business owner or a manager? I don't know if I have the answer, but um, that's the times we're going through. And uh, I mean, we respect the religion, that isn't the problem, but I, I don't know, tough problem, really tough. Uh, we have a business down here in Sioux Falls too called Panther Graphics. So the printing has been my whole life really in farming besides that when I can. And uh, I just was in the right job. I got found my calling. God was good to me. And I think back of all the stuff that happened, you know, the thousands of ideas and, or uh, things, processes, uh, I don't know, build outs on the machine. We build on the building five times. Of course, I mean, I had good team and good staff. I wasn't doing a lot of it. In fact, I would, my days, a lot of times, I'd go to quality at six in the morning. Oh, one of the things I was gonna tell you this too. I would, uh, a lot of times at QQP, I would do all the bidding there for quite a while. 
And I'd go in the, oh, I don't know, deep, kind of dependent on my workload, but maybe six in the morning I'd go in there, but be, if I didn't say the rosary on the way, before I touched that door handle, I would have said some kind of a prayer. But I was usually mad by the time I got to my office anyway, because I got, came in the front, because somebody would be laying, we see some work here and some work there. I mean, you know how it is. Well, why, why do you do it this way? Why? Anyway, but I had to have God there to keep a guy going. And uh, so that was so important to pray. And also, um, kind of getting into my final words here a little bit, you know, so what do you do when 9-11 happens? You got 200 people working for you in one division, and here's 9-11, shut the whole country down. Oh, gee, that's good. New York, you, I did a lot of business in New York, probably within 500 miles of New York, south, north, east, a little bit, I mean west. And uh, here's 9-11, I'll tell you what, there was nothing going on there for a while. Or 2008, or COVID, you know, we've all been through this, right? I guess what I'm trying to say to you, I remember, I don't know one, which one of these, probably all of them, I sat in my office and thought, I just probably just thought, and thought, you know, God, we're just going to do the best we can here. That's all you can do, right? And we got through it, you know, but it was pretty, pretty tough. You know, a lot of guys or staff, they don't, uh, how was that story? There's another, you probably heard it, but janitor was there was some ceo up at about i hope i say this right the 50 way up high in some big city on the floor looking out the ceo was looking out the window had his door open though janitors goes by and uh looks in there goes by and meets somebody down the hall says you know look at that guy there he ain't doing nothing and the guy says if you'd be thinking what he's thinking you probably have his job so you know that they don't realize a lot of times what we do as owners, and I, and I ain't bragging. I'm just saying, it's it's uh, the way it goes. What do I got left? What I'm done? Oh, oh I got to Can I go another minute? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, be aware. I want to. I want to leave you guys with some thoughts here. Be aware of the miracles happening in your life. Boy, I mean, don't wait till you're 68 years old to figure it out. It's hard sometimes, but just be aware of that. Uh, See God's presence in the people and children around you. Real quick here, I, uh, again, I was talking to Father Beach. Well, he's in nursing home now. I go into the dollar store, and I got something, whatever. I get up to the, you know, where you're going to check out, and there's about three people. Here's this couple with a little girl about this high. I don't know, maybe seven years old. She was, I could tell she was maybe handicapped. I mean, she could walk good and everything, but just, I'm standing there, and I smiled at her a little bit. She comes over and gives me the biggest hug. So, you know, I, and I was fine. I, Took three times I gave her a great big hug. Her parents kind of got nervous about it. And I thought, well, what? And anyway, I told that to Father Gadish and said, wasn't that an example for her parents? It's not how I looked at it. You know, that little girl, she just wanted love, just so precious. Um, forgive. You've got to forgive people. If you don't, oh, you know, you just can't be open, be loving, or anything like that. Um, if you have your faith, you know, I, I guess the way I look at it, I... Yeah, I've accumulated wealth. I don't know. Kathy would probably say my wife's opposite of me. You know, she, I take risks, and, but I hope they're good ones usually. And uh, you've got to have faith. Nothing can hurt you if you've got the faith. That's the way I look at it. I guess we came in the world with nothing. We're going out with nothing. Be, got, be confident. Leave it in God's hands. Go to Mass. Pray daily. Use the sacraments. We're lucky to have penance. In my opinion, I guess, get your penance done. You go to... Holy Eucharist, what, what better deal is there than that? Ask people to pray for you. How many have done that? You know, I never did that either, but I've lately I've a little more, probably not to everybody, but uh, Father Mark, he'd always say that. Well, pray for me, pray for me. I thought, well, I can say it too, you know, it's sincere. Give people the benefit of the doubt, you know. People have trouble, and, uh, you know, rather than jump right onto some kind of conclusion, I would say I'm probably not very good at this, but. I sometimes sit back and think, well, I just wonder what happened in their day. You know, so give them the, be kind as much as you can. Give them benefit of the doubt. You never know what they're thinking or what they're going through. And there's more good in the world than they want us to believe, I would say, too. No question about that. Pray for your enemies. That's a trick, isn't it? But you got to. I mean, a lot of times, I don't know about you, but there's been people that I, oh man, I got a you know, relative, maybe, oh gosh, I got to go over there again. Well, I try to say a prayer or two, and that does help, <laughs> you know. 
maybe not 100 percent, but um, okay. Uh, I'm done. I did it. Okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Joel.